Part One, Chapter Nine of A Brief History of English and American Literature. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Kalinda. A Brief History of English and American Literature by Henry A. Beers. Part One, Chapter Nine Theological and Religious Literature in Great Britain by John Fletcher Hurst. Miracle plays, rude dramatic representations of the chief events in scripture history, were used for popular instruction before the invention of printing. In England they began as early as the twelfth century. Moral plays, or moralities, were of the same origin, though dating from the fifteenth century. These were somewhat more refined than the miracle plays, and usually set forth the excellence of the virtues, such as truth, mercy, and the like. Both miracle and moral plays were under the conduct of the clergy. John Bale, 1495 to 1563, was Bishop of Ossory, and wrote much for popular reform. He was the author of nineteen miracle plays. Lord Edward Herbert of Cherbury, 1581 to 1648, wrote a deistical work, De Religione Gentilium, the first of that school of writers which later appeared in Bolingbroke. John Spottiswood, 1565-1639, to Archbishop of St. Andrews and afterward Chancellor of Scotland, wrote a voluminous History of the Church of Scotland. George Sandys, 1577-1643, to distinguished also as one of the earliest literary characters in America, wrote metrical versions of several of the poetical books of the Bible, and also a tragedy called Christ's Passion. John Knox, 1505-1572, to the great Scotch reformer and polemic, while more prominent as the preacher and spokesman of the Scotch Reformation, wrote First Blast of the Trumpet Against the Monstrous Regimen of Women, 1558, and The History of the Reformation of Religion Within the Realm of Scotland, published after his death. John Jewell, 1522-1571, wrote in Latin his Apologia Ecclesia Anglicanae. William Whittingham, 1524 to 1589, who succeeded Knox as pastor of the English church at Geneva, aided in making the Genevan version of the Bible, and also cooperated in the Sternhold and Hopkins translation of the Psalms. John Fox, 1517 to 1587, was the author of the Book of Martyrs, whose full title was Acts and Monuments of These Latter and Perilous Days, Touching Matters of the Church. An abridgment of the work has had a very wide circulation. John Aylmer, 1521 to 1594, replied to Knox's first blast of the trumpet in a work called An Harbor for Faithful and True Subjects. Nicholas Sanders, 1527 to 1580, a Roman Catholic professor of Oxford, wrote The Rock of the Church, a defense of the primacy of Peter and the bishops of Rome. Robert Parsons, 1546 to 1610, a Jesuit, wrote several works in advocacy of Roman Catholicism and some political tracts. John Reynolds, 1549-1607, to a learned Hebraist of Oxford, wrote many ecclesiastical works in Latin and English. He was a chief promoter of King James's version of the Bible. Miles Smith, died 1624, Thomas Bilson, 1536-1616, to John Boyes, 1560-1643, to and George Abbott, 1562-1633, to Archbishop of Canterbury, were all co-workers on the King James translation of the Scriptures. Next in importance to the English Bible in its effect upon literature stands the English Prayer Book, which is the rich mosaic of many minds. It came through the primer of the fourteenth century, and contained the more fundamental and familiar portions of the Book of Common Prayer, such as the Ten Commandments, the Lord's Prayer, the Litany, and the Apostles' Creed. This compilation differed in form and somewhat in content in the different dioceses of England, and was partly in Latin and partly in English. In 1542 an attempt was made to produce a common form for all England, and to have it entirely in English. The Committee of Convocation, who had the work in charge, were prevented from making it complete through the refusal of Henry VIII to continue the approval which he had given to the appointment of the committee. However, under Edward VI, a commission headed by Archbishop Cranmer carried their work through, and it was accepted and its use made compulsory by Parliament. It was published in 1549 as the first prayer book of Edward VI. Three years later the second prayer book of Edward VI was issued. In 
it being a revision of the first, also under the shaping hand of Cranmer. The prayer book received its final revision and substantially its present form in the reign of Elizabeth in 1559, although in 1662 there was added to the morning and evening prayer a collection of prayers and thanksgivings upon several occasions. Gathering thus through three centuries the choice treasures of confession and devotion of the strong and reverent English nation, it has been a large element in the literary training, not only of communicants in the Anglican, the Episcopal, and the Methodist churches, but in a measure also of those who have received their religious instruction and have worshipped in other branches of the Protestant church. The work of the Assembly of Divines at Westminster, 1643-1649, particularly the Confession of Faith and the Shorter Catechism, became, as specimens of strong and pure English, potent factors in the intellectual and literary discipline of the Presbyterians in all parts of the world. The modern psalms and hymns, or the simplified and popularized forms of the earlier and medieval worship, have had vastly to do with the daily thought and education of the people into whose lives they have brought not only increase of lofty devotion, but also a positive and stimulative culture. Foremost of these collections was that made by Thomas Sternhold, John Hopkins, and others, and known as the Psalter of Sternhold and Hopkins, published in 1562. Francis Rouse made a version in 1645, which after revision was adopted in 1649 and largely used by the Scotch Church. A new version was that by Nahum Tate and Nicholas Brady, which appeared in 1696 and has since been called the Psalter of Tate and Brady. The first English hymn-book adapted for public worship was that of Isaac Watts, appearing about 1709, although several minor collections and individual productions had preceded Watts, among which should be mentioned those of Joseph Stennett, John Mason, and the fine hymns of Bishop Ken and Joseph Addison. A little later, the prolific and spiritual Charles Wesley, aided by the somewhat stricter taste of his more celebrated brother John, began his wonderful series of published hymns which, together with those of Watts, have since formed the larger portion of the Protestant hymnody of the world. Others of the eighteenth century who have made contributions to the sacred lyrics of the Church are John Byram, 1691-1763, Philip Doddridge, 1702-1751, Joseph Hart, 1712-1768, Anne Steele, 1716-1778, Benjamin Bedham, 1717-1795, John Senek, seventeen seventeen to seventeen fifty five, Thomas Oliver, seventeen twenty five to seventeen ninety nine, Joseph Grigg, seventeen twenty eight to seventeen sixty eight, Augustus M. Toplady, seventeen forty to seventeen seventy eight, and Edward Perronet, died seventeen ninety two. Approaching our own time, the ranks of our hymn writers include James Montgomery, seventeen seventy one to eighteen fifty four, whose Christian Psalmist was published in eighteen twenty five, Thomas Kelly of Dublin, seventeen sixty nine to eighteen fifty five, Harriet Auber, seventeen seventy three to eighteen thirty two, Reginald Haber, seventeen eighty three to eighteen twenty six, Sir Robert Grant, seventeen eighty five to eighteen thirty eight, Josiah Condor, seventeen eighty nine to eighteen fifty five, Charlotte Elliot, 1789 to 1871, Sir John Boring, 1792 to 1872, Henry Francis Light, 1793 to 1847, John Cable, 1792 to 1866, whose Christian year came out in 1827, John H. Newman, 1801 to 1890, Sarah Flower Adams, 1805 to 1849, and Horatius Bonar, 1808 to 1869. Richard Mant, seventeen seventy six to eighteen forty eight, Henry Alford, eighteen ten to eighteen seventy one, F. W. Faber, eighteen fifteen to eighteen sixty three, John Mason Neal, eighteen eighteen to eighteen sixty six, Miss Catherine Winkworth, born eighteen twenty nine, and some others have given many beautiful and stirring translations from the Latin and German hymns of the ancient and medieval periods. Theological writers of the middle of the seventeenth century are numerous. Chief of those belonging to the Anglican Church may be named Joseph Hall, Bishop of Norwich, 1574 to 1656, whose Episcopacy by Divine Right was replied to in Smectimnus, the joint production of five dissenting divines, Stephen Marshall, Edward Calamy, Thomas Young, Matthew Newcomer, and William Spurston, 1575-1588. 
James Usher, 1580 to 1656, a man of vast literary learning and most known by his Sacred Chronology, published after his death, Thomas Fuller and Jeremy Taylor, mentioned in a previous chapter, John Cozen, 1594 to 1672, who wrote chiefly devotional treatises, William Chillingworth, 1602 to 1664, whose Religion of Protestants has had a wide circulation, John Pearson, 1612 to 1686, whose Exposition of the Creed became a standard, Ralph Cudworth, 1617 to 1688, whose Intellectual System of the Universe dealt a stunning blow to the atheism of his day, and Isaac Barrow, 1630 to 1677, the learned vice-chancellor of Cambridge, wit, mathematician, and theologian all in one, who left a rich legacy in his sermons. Of the non-conforming authors deserving notice, Richard Baxter, 1615 to 1691, is the most voluminous, if not also the most luminous. Controversy engaged his pen almost constantly, but his most permanent works were his Call to the Unconverted, and the saint's everlasting rest. John Owen, 1616 to 1683, was a leading Puritan writer, and under Cromwell was vice-chancellor of Oxford University. His commentary on the Epistles of the Hebrews and his book on the Holy Spirit are still in use and highly prized. His pen was strong rather than elegant. John Bunyan's immortal allegory throws a halo on universal literature. John Howe, 1630 to 1705, the chief author among the Puritans, wrote many strong works, among which of special note are The Living Temple and The Office and Work of the Holy Spirit. He was Cromwell's chaplain. The spiritual writings of Samuel Rutherford, 1600 to 1661, The Scotch Divine, The Annotations on the Psalms by Henry Ainsworth, died 1662, an independent who was an exile in Holland for conscience's sake, the expository writings of Thomas Manton, sixteen twenty to sixteen seventy seven, the synopsis of Matthew Poole, sixteen twenty four to sixteen seventy nine, later abridged into his celebrated Annotations upon the Bible, the sermons of Stephen Charnock, sixteen twenty eight to sixteen eighty, particularly the one on the divine attributes, and an alarm to an unconverted sinners by Joseph Alaney, sixteen thirty three to sixteen eighty eight which has had an immense circulation, form a galaxy in the theological firmament of the time of Milton. A later group of theological writers in the latter part of the seventeenth century contains the commanding figures of Simon Patrick, 1626 to 1707, bishop and author of A Commentary on the Old Testament, John Flavel, 1627 to 1691, and his works on practical piety, John Tillotson, 1630 to 1694, the Anglican Archbishop, whose eloquent sermons are still held in high repute, Robert South, 1633 to 1716, the great pulpit orator, whose discourses are an ornament to the English tongue, Edward Stillingfleet, 1635 to 1699, from whose prolific pen came several valuable treatises, one of which was The Antiquities of the British Churches, and William Beveridge, 1637 to 1708, whose private thoughts upon religion is still in much esteem. To those we may add Thomas Ken, 1637 to 1710, the good bishop now best known as the author of Praise God from Whom All Blessings Flow, Benjamin Keach, 1640 to 1704, a Baptist preacher of much note and author of Gospel Mysteries Opened, which, like his other writings, is marred by an excessive use of figures, Gilbert Burnett, 1643 to 1709, the writer and bishop, who mingled freely in the political affairs of the day and wrote much on a variety of subjects, one being a history of the reformation of the Church of England, William Wall, 1646 to 1728, the prominent defender of infant baptism, Humphrey Prideaux, 1648 to 1724, who wrote The Connection of the Old and New Testaments, and Matthew Henry, 1662 to 1714, still valued for his quaint and suggestive Commentary on the Scriptures. Here, too, belong George Fox, 1624 to 1690, and Robert Barclay, 1648 to 1690, the heroic founder and the learned champion of the Society of Friends, the former's journal and the latter's apology for the true Christian divinity being worthy of special note. William Penn, 1644 to 1718, more eminent as the chief colonizer of Pennsylvania, also wrote many powerful works in advocacy of Quaker teachings, and William Sewell's, 1650 to 1726, History of the Quakers, is a notable contribution to the literature of that much misunderstood and persecuted people.
Among those who graced the first half of the eighteenth century we find the Irish man of letters Charles Leslie, 1650-1722, who gave, among others, a celebrated treatise on A Short and Easy Method with Deists. Francis Atterbury, 1662-1732, Bishop of Rochester, whose sermons still survive. William Wollaston, 1659-1724, known as the author of The Religion of Nature, A Plea for Truth. Samuel Clark, 1675-1729, the philosophical writer of The Demonstration of Being and Attributes of God. Matthew Tyndall, 1657-1733, the leading deists of his day, whose chief work was Christianity as Old as Creation. Robert Woodrow, 1679-1734, a Scotch preacher who wrote A History of the Sufferings of the Church of Scotland and Thomas Wilson, 1663-1755, to Bishop of Soda and Man for fifty-seven years, and the author of many useful works on the Scriptures and Christianity. Bishop Joseph Butler, 1692-1752, to appeared as the champion of Christianity and successfully answered the deistical tendency of Tyndall and others by his analogy of religion natural and revealed to the constitution and course of nature which, though obscure in style, is still in high repute for its massive thought and mighty logic. Thomas Stackhouse, 1680-1752, and his History of the Bible, John Bampton, 1689-1751, whose estate still speaks at Oxford in defense of the Christianity in the annual lectures on divinity, Daniel Waterland, 1683-1740, in his defense of the divinity of Christ, and Joseph Bingham, 1668-1723, in his learned treatise on the antiquities of the Christian Church, are also in the front rank of this period. Daniel Neal, 1678-1743, in his History of the Puritans, John Leland, 1691-1766, the Dublin preacher, in his View of the Deistical Writers, and Philip Doddridge, 1702-1751, in his Family Expositor, and his briefer and more famous Rise and Progress of Religion in the Soul, furnished valuable contributions to theological literature. The latter half of the eighteenth century was prolific of letters. Noteworthy among those who wrote on religious themes are the following— Nathaniel Lardner, 1684-1768, who wrote The Credibility of the Gospel History, William Law, 1687-1761, whose Serious Call to a Holy Life and Christian Perfection are still powerful works, Richard Challoner, 1691-1781, a Roman Catholic author of many practical and devotional works and of a version of the Bible much prized in his own church, Albin Butler, 1700-1773, who compiled The Lives of the Saints, William Warburton, 1698-1779, in his Divine Legation of Moses, Alexander Cruden, 1701-1770, the Scotch author of the famous Concordance to the Holy Scriptures, and Lord George Littleton, 1708-1773, the author of Observations on the Conversion and Apostleship of St. Paul. In the same category belong Robert Louth, 1710-1787, whose book on Hebrew poetry is still consulted, James Hervey, 1713-1758, whose meditations became very popular, Hugh Blair, 1718-1800, the Scotchman whose sermons for many years rivaled his lectures on rhetoric in popularity, Joseph Priestley, 1733-1804, illustrious in the annals of chemical discovery, who wrote Institutes of Natural and Revealed Religion, and is one of the most distinguished Socinian writers, and William Paley, 1743-1805, whose Natural Theology and Hore Pauline are still standard works. During this period also came the great impulse to the literature of the common people through the tireless pen of John Wesley, 1703-1791, whose sermons and notes on the New Testament have had a powerful influence wherever the Wesleyan revival has spread. James McKnight, 1721-1800, the scholarly commentator and harmonist, John Fletcher, 1729-1785, the sweet-souled defender of Methodism and author of Checks to Antinomianism, Bishop Richard Watson, 1737-1816, the learned apologist. Augustus M. Toplady, 1740-1778, the hymnist and polemic. Joseph Milner, 1744-1797, the church historian. 
Thomas Coke, 1747 to 1814, in his Commentary on the Old and New Testaments, and Andrew Fuller, 1754 to 1815, were authors of marked force and ability. Belonging to the first quarter of the nineteenth century, the leading theological productions are The Immateriality and Immortality of the Soul by Samuel Drew, 1765 to 1833, the Translation of the Book of Job by John Mason Good, 1764 to 1827. The Popular Commentaries on the Bible by Thomas Scott, 1747 to 1821, Adam Clark, 1762 to 1832, and Joseph Benson, 1748 to 1821. The Sermons of Robert Hall, 1764 to 1831. The Great Baptist Preacher. The Introduction to the Literary History of the Bible by James Townley, died 1833. The Missionary Narratives of Henry Martin, 1781-1812, William Ward, 1769-1822, and John Williams, 1796-1839, and The Pathetic Story of the Dairyman's Daughter, by Leg Richmond, 1772-1827. A little later in this century, the first ranks of theological scholarship included the Wordsworths, Christopher, 1774-1846, the brother of the poet, and his two sons, Charles, 1806-1892, and Christopher, Jr., 1809-1885. Tracts for the Times, written by a group of men styling themselves Anglo-Catholics, whose leaders were Edward B. Pusey, 1800-1882, John H. Newman, 1801-1890, John Kebbell, 1792-1866, Richard H. Froude and others, began in 1833, and for several years continued to be published, reaching ninety in number. Their main purpose was a discussion and defense of the character and work of the established church, but a large result was that several of the leading spirits, with about two hundred clergymen and the same number of prominent laymen, became Roman Catholics. This high church series of writings was followed in 1860 by Essays and Reviews, a volume containing seven articles, whose authors were Frederick Temple, born 1821, Roland Williams, 1817-1870, Baden-Powell, 1796-1860, Henry B. Wilson, born 1804, C. W. Goodwin, Mark Pattison, 1813-1884, and Benjamin Jowett, 1817-1893. The purpose of these men was to liberalize the thought of the church. They accomplished this result, and with it the overthrow of the faith of some. Thomas Chalmers, 1780-1847, the great Scotch preacher, left much fruit of his pen, the most celebrated being Astronomical Discourses. Other distinguished books are A Practical View of Christianity by William Wilberforce, 1759-1833, Horae Homileticae by Charles Simeon, 1759 to 1836, The Lives of Knox and Melville by Thomas McCree, 1772 to 1835, Horae Mosaicae by George Stanley Faber, 1773 to 1854, The Scripture Testimony to the Messiah by John Pye Smith, 1774 to 1851, Theological Institutes by the Wesleyan theologian Richard Watson, 1781 to 1833. The Histories of the Jews and of Christianity by Henry Hart Millman, 1791-1868. The Cyclopedia of Biblical Literature by John Kitto, 1804-1854. Mammon by John Harris, 1804-1856. The Theological Essays of John Frederick Denison Maurice, 1805-1872. Missions, The Chief End of the Christian Church by Alexander Duff, 1806 to 1878, The Sermons of Frederick William Robertson, 1816 to 1853, and The Life and Epistles of Paul by William J. Conybeare, 1815 to 1857, and John S. Housen, 1816 to 1885. The latter half of the present century has been marked by many strong and profound theological publications, of which we may name as worthy of particular notice. The Introduction to the Study of Holy Scriptures by Thomas Hartwell Horne, 1780 to 1862, Historic Doubts Relative to Napoleon Bonaparte by Richard Watley, 1787 to 1863, Apologia por Vita Sua of John H. Newman, 1801 to 1890, The Typology of Scripture by Patrick Fairburn, 1805 to 1892, The Eclipse of Faith by Henry Rogers, 1806 to 1877, 
The Notes on the Parables and Miracles by Richard Chevenix Trench, 1807-1886. The Temporal Mission of the Holy Ghost by Henry Edward Manning, 1808-1892. The Series of the Lectures on the Scriptures by John Gumming, 1810-1881. The Greek New Testament, edited by Henry Alford, 1810-1871. And the same by Samuel Prideau Tregelles, 1813-1875. The Historical Works of Arthur Penryn Stanley, 1815-1881, Hypatia, or Old Foes with a New Face, by Charles Kingsley, 1819-1875, Ecce Homo, by John Robert Seeley, 1834-1895, The Sermons of Charles Haddon Spurgeon, 1834-1892, and Natural Law in the Spiritual World, the Brilliant Venture of the Beloved and Lamented Henry Drummond, 1851-1897, whose greatest thing in the world bids fair to become a Christian classic. End of Part 1, Chapter 9 Recording by Kalinda in Lüneburg, Germany, on March 6, 2009